brown. So let me try. Goro mi ugut. Good, good. A roaster, good start. <laughs> so I would like to, to thank you for your warm welcome. I, uh, I wanted to visit Ireland for a long time, but the good thing about having uh, children is that they grow, and my two daughters two years ago said, the perfect place, Daddy, to spend our August is Ireland and Scotland. And after some convincing, I, I, we went, and it was really a wonderful idea. Uh, so I had the opportunity to spend one week here, and uh, we went uh, to Sligo, uh, to, uh, to the west, uh, spent two days here in, uh, in Dublin. And, uh, and it really, although the, the crisis, of course, has already started, um, I was asking, where are the Poles? I heard the place is called Dublinsky also, but there are already fewer of them. They said, well, they're gone. They're back to, they're back to Warsaw. And as you mentioned, 20 years ago, I, I was a, a, a young advisor to the Polish government at that time. And this transition story mm. takes unexpected turns. For instance, last year, I was able to meet my former head in the Ministry of Privatization, where I worked in Poland, Janusz Lewandowski, who is now the commissioner in charge of the budget of the European Commission. <laughs> and on Sunday, I mean, we're going this weekend for an official visit to, um, to, uh, uh, to Warsaw and to Poland. And uh, on Sunday night, I have a, a dinner with uh, Leszek Balcerowicz, who is uh, one of the great figures of transition, I would say, overall. And here's uh, somebody who had a big imprint on our transition, so O'Donnell, who uh, in, the, in the UN overall complex helped us uh, quite a lot. He was quite famous uh, when he was in Belgrade, talking on many, many things. We didn't understand everything, but uh, it was always very interesting. So uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be here. And I would like uh, just to tell you um, some elements about where Serbia and to some extent what the, where the Western Balkans are. I have to be careful because sometimes we from Serbia are being uh, uh, not always welcome to talk about other countries as well. And uh, please see it as really a care for a region because there is an increased realization, I would say also in the Balkans, that it's difficult to be successful if, uh, if nobody else is successful around you. So that's why we warmly welcome um, the accession of Croatia to the European Union in July of 2013. This does not mean that we have solved every open issue with Croatia, but... Uh, if there's one bilateral relation which over the last few years has really improved, is it, it is the one between Serbia and Croatia. And I have to tell you, with Slovenia, for instance, um, we will be very hard pressed to find a single open issue. And as a symbol, when three months ago, a Serbian juice maker, Nektar, purchased what used to be the leader in juice making in ex-Yugoslavia, Fructal, this was a vindication, in a way, in a very direct way, of the European idea over a nationalistic idea. Let me illustrate. In the times of the breakup of Yugoslavia, there were Serbian national saying that were taken for a ride by the Slovenes. Our great fruit, and it is great fruit okay. in, in Serbia, may, make no mistake, and eat our raspberries, they're the best. <laughs> we send them to Slovenia, they're transformed, and then we pay dearly for those Slovene Jews. And so we are being exploited by Slovenia within this Yugoslavia, and we have to boycott their products. And so when our juice maker took over Fructal, I asked, where are you, nationalists? What do you have to say now mm. about this? Now Fructal, a Slovene company, is in Serbian hands. And by the way, Slovenia has already invested almost 2 billion euro in Serbia, with more than 500 companies present in all directions, and they are really considered as domestic. Together, we're stronger. Together, we have a chance facing the multinational companies. Not that they're enemies, but sometimes it's good also to have some decision-making capacity, at least in the region. Mm. So when the Slovene company Gorenje, which is producing, and it's already, I would say, a world brand, decided to locate yet a third or fourth factory in Serbia, this is also recognizing the relative place one can have in this value chain mm. to mutual benefit. So, before I tell you about what politicians have to talk about, which are problems that we need to solve, let me tell you that not everything is going poorly in the Balkans. Many destroyed relations are being improved. Many, uh, I would say, things are being mended. And uh, if one looks at uh, what people listen to, uh, you would say there, has been, uh, there will be um, a, uh, this weekend a singer from uh, Sarajevo, 
Dino Merlin, who uh, was under the shells during the shelling of Sarajevo. And he made at that time statements which were really strong. He, without one single uh, second of advertisement, filled in three and apparently four times the Belgrade Arena, which is 25,000 people. Ordinary folks who want to listen to him because he's a great singer. And then when Russia cut the tap on natural gas, was it three years ago, um, my president was very active and we kind of found some reserves in, uh, in Hungary and, uh, uh, and Germany. We're grateful to them. And I have to tell you that the ordinary people really felt good when we were able immediately to, to share that gas also with our uh, Bosnian friends. Because yes, the Bosnians were the biggest victims of the previous uh, conflict. Nationalist people tell you, but then in the Second World War it was the Serbs, and it's true, it was the Serbs the biggest victims in the Second World War. <coughs> But what is coming, I would say, more and more to the fore, and here I see the main role of Europe, useful role, as some say, the last positive utopia. Definitely under stress right now. But this idea that put basically Germany and France definitely not to wage war anymore. And for us in the Balkans, joining the European Union is a way also to make sure that it happens never again that we be together around the same table and we solve any differences through discussion, not through weapons. And so that's, I think, why, when you, as you mentioned in 2008, there was debate within the European Union whether Serbia should sign the SAA mm -hmm. because Mladic was still in The Hague. In the end, there was a consensus to sign the SAA and then there was some legal innovation, suspended immediately. I bet you it wasn't possibly legally, but... Uh, Apparently, everything is possible in Europe. Uh, some people are saying, no, Serbia has to prove that it's truly democratic, and it should not be allowed to move closer to Europe before it demonstrates that by capturing Maric and Hadžić and Karadžić at that time. We were of a different opinion. We said, by having a true European agenda, you will be strengthening the pro-European forces. You will strengthen the strands in society that really see uh, eye to eye with European values. Through this path, we will strengthen also the civilian control of the deep power structures of secret police and army. This is the view that prevailed. And that view allowed, let me just recap what has been done after a pro-European government was formed in 2008. Three days after we ended up, and yes, only eight years down the road after the removal of Milosevic by appointing a head of the secret police, which really shared those values, European values, to find Karadzic. And then, yes, it took too much time, this May, to find Mladic, and in July, Karadzic. And that way, all the 46 entities were found arrested and extradited to the Hague Tribunal. We did not do it because of this conditionality. We see the reconciliation as one of the most important business that we have in the region. And so my president went twice to Srebrenica. He didn't do it as a marketing trick. He did it through a heartfelt and also real politic point of view. We will not be able, as a Serbian people, as a Serbian society, as a Serbian state, to be successful if we don't have a reconciliation with Bosniaks. That's why also the resolution in our parliament last March did not only have apologies on this terrible crime. It was also a place where we affirmed the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina as uh, one of the main elements of our foreign policy. We are against the breakup of Bosnia. We are against the breakup of Macedonia. We are against the breakup of Serbia. And we are against the breakup of Kosovo. We are against all breakups. We support the territorial integrity of all countries. We expect others to respect ours. And there is no valid reason why Serbia should be the only democratic country post-World War, a full member of the UN, to be broken up against its own will. And yes, with Ireland, we have this difference. And just half an hour ago, we had a very interesting discussion about how maybe the Good Friday Agreement would have some lessons for us. Power sharing. Making sure that even, as some MPs said, after 700 years of conflict and blood, there was a capacity to face 
the real situation and to see also the other side of the problem. We see the UDI as a way to look at only one side of the problem, one reality, which is the Albanian reality of Kosovo, but then ignoring the other reality, which is Serbian. And so, if there are today barricades in the north of Kosovo, it is because there is also people who do not consent by being ruled by Pristina in the way that Kosovo Albanians did not consent to be ruled by Belgrade. So the solution is to find a settlement. A settlement in which everybody in the Balkans, everybody in Kosovo will feel secure and will see a future for themselves. So this is why in September of last year we backed together with Ireland and all the members of the European Union, all the that recognize, but also the five non-recognizers of Kosovo, a beginning of a dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. Then all institutions in Kosovo started to fall down. The president resigned, the prime minister resigned, there were elections, then a new president was elected, and after a few days he had to resign. There was a new president. And then in March, finally, we started the dialogue. We waited seven months for it to start. Some progress was made. And then in July, unfortunately, after an embargo, there was a forcible one-sided attempt to change the reality on the ground in the north of Kosovo by sending the shock troops to Rosu uh, and transporting without this being negotiated and agreed upon with the local Serbs, us in Belgrade or the international community. And I can tell you that it was done without the knowledge of many European and other countries to try to impose a new situation on the ground. This is actually what has led uh, to this tension. And all along, because it is, of course, easy to commit to peace when things are peaceful. My president, in the middle of this crisis, said Serbia will not retort to force. And politically, this is not necessarily the easier way. But this is our policy. And we believe that after this attempt, even those who maybe thought that there is some, I would say, potential in that type of approach, have to realize that you cannot pretend to facilitate trade and then lead us to a situation where there are barricades, barbed wires, and bullets flying. That's not the way forward. And maybe some had as an idea to go the same way on the tribunal in the north of uh, Kosovska Mitrovica, or maybe to ask for people who actually are not sharing, typically, our political stance. I'm speaking of the leaders, political leaders of the Serbs in the north of Kosovo, but nevertheless, one has to admit that they have a legitimacy. They have been elected by people. So there are no parallel institutions in the north of Kosovo, as some people say, in the sense that there is a need to be parallel to something. What you have in the north of Kosovo is a Serbian institution that exists for dozens and dozens of years, which does continue. And it will be a twilight zone to try to think that one can cancel the hospitals and the education and cultural aspects and the municipalities and trying to replace them by institutions that would not have legitimacy, that they will not have consent. And indeed, we are back again to the need to come back to the negotiating table and to a settlement. This is why it's important to reconnect on the dialogue. This is why it's important to uh, act upon the proposal that Belgrade has made on how to man the so-called gates 1 and 31. And I know I'm talking to a very sophisticated crowd, and you know what I'm talking about. Those are the two um, administrative points where uh, there's an attempt to instill uh, both ULEX, that is acceptable as long as it's neutral, also with the uh, Kosovo Albanian uh, uh, customs. Our proposal is to have an integrated management with Serbian officials being present as well. And uh, I believe that uh, the latest statements coming from Pristina augur, and I'll have to be cautious because one should not be <laughs> optimistic. Uh, until things really realize that uh, next Monday in Brussels when the meeting uh, takes place between uh, the uh, negotiators of Belgrade and Pristina under the auspices of Robert Cooper, we might be getting really close or completely to the solution in order to unlock uh, those two border, uh, those two uh, uh, points and then to have blockade stopped and then to have uh, uh, trade flow again. By the way, once the agreement on the custom stamps, which was one of the elements of the dialogue, was agreed on the 2nd of September, there were resistances by the Serbs in the north. But in the end of the day, when Pristina and Belgrade agree on something with the support of the European Union, those agreements stick. And uh, on all the other 
uh, border points. Uh, there is a flow of goods. And in fact, the Serbian goods, there's about 400 million euro worth of uh, uh, Serbian goods placed on the Kosovo uh, market. They're back. They've been called for, uh, for a boycott. Some countries in the region, sometimes a little bit clumsily, uh, have tried kind of to push out uh, the presence of brands that people in Kosovo know already for decades, but that wasn't to be. And that also shows that this reality, economic reality, is here with us to stay. And so to sum up on the issue at hand, before I move on to other uh, topics, maybe slightly easier, to sum up on Kosovo, indeed, as was the proven after 700 years, I understand the conflict uh, here in Ireland, the only way forward is to have a settlement which recognizes that uh, sometimes there's a need to share power. Sometimes there's a need to combine, in an original way, two realities, two legitimate goals on the same territory. And I would say that that's definitely what Serbia wants. We know we cannot join the European Union before the issue of Kosovo is settled. The settlement cannot be for Serbia recognizing the UDI. Today or tomorrow, you will not find a democratically elected leader of Serbia that will be signing on that dotted line. But this does not mean that the solution is not possible. And where we look forward is support from Ireland. Yes, Ireland in particular because of this history, and no parallel is perfect. I'm not saying let's have Good Friday for the Balkans. I'm not saying let's have the two Germany solution in 1972 for the Balkans. And I'm not saying let's have the South Tyrol for the Balkans. I'm not saying let's have the, uh, uh, those islands uh, where uh, all the islands were with sovereignty share between uh, Finland and, and Sweden are necessarily applied. But there is ample examples if one really looks forward and is trying to have a European compromise solution rather than trying to have one nationalism win against another one. Next step, Monday, the, board, the, 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 the integrated management of the points, reopening it, coming back to the table, implementing, and this week, uh, on Tuesday, our government approved the enabling sub-legislation for uh, the uh, civil registry agreement that was reached. We will do more this week. And then demonstrate to Ireland and our European partners that we mean business. We mean business when we say we would like to, through this dialogue, solve first the everyday issues, including those which are in the opinion. You know that in order to get the beginning of the negotiations, there's issues about energy, telecom, mutual recognition of diplomas, and a couple of other things. But actually our goal is then is to move on to even more sensitive territory and to make sure that everybody has a European future in, in the Balkans. Now about the region. You mentioned Bosnia-Herzegovina. I already discussed a bit about Bosnia and Herzegovina through the human aspect, because that one should not be lost. We like the same music, we eat the same chevapcici, people again anti intermarry, singers cross borders, TVs are ever more regional, and people visit each other more and more. On the political level, Serbia is a co-signatory and a guarantor of the Dayton agreements. Serbia is committed to the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina and will not support any move trying to break it up. Serbia at the same time is committed to making sure that any changes in the makeup of Bosnia and Herzegovina is agreed by all three communities. The attempts that we have seen maybe from time to time to try to use the leverage of some parts of the international community to change the makeup of Bosnia and Herzegovina, a very specific state, let's face it, are doomed to fail unless they are preceded by an agreement by the three communities. We cannot have it both ways, having a democracy and then having political leaders that are elected by those communities and then trying to refuse them legitimacy in order to negotiate what is actually their everyday life and of the people who elected them which is the functioning of Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is no doubt that not everybody within Bosnia and Herzegovina sees eye to eye on how Bosnia and Herzegovina should function. But the only way forward is again to find a way forward and Serbia really looks forward to the formation of the Bosnia and Herzegovina government because we hope that that country also will be able then to deposit its uh, uh, letter of uh, asking uh, a candidate status to be granted. And we were very happy 
when Bosnia and Herzegovina, one year after Montenegro, Serbia, and Macedonia was allowed to have a visa free uh, for their citizens. And I would like to remind you that one of the things we heard, because there's this lingering doubt about what the real intentions of Serbia is, so people said, we'll watch you. We don't want you to use the visa free travel of Serbia to be leveraged on Bosnia. Let me translate in English. We don't want you to give passports to Serbian Serbs in Bosnia. We want Serbs in Bosnia to be able to travel free, visa free with their Bosnia and Herzegovina passport. And that's okay with us. This is completely uh, 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 logical with our policy. And the dual citizenship between Serbia and Bosnia is limited to a few hundred people. So sometimes we hear from maybe some other politicians in the region that Belgrade is trying to destabilize Sarajevo through Banja Luka. Well, may I just not uh, putting into question the Croatian policy toward Bosnia and Herzegovina, just to remind you to the fact that Croats in Bosnia vote for the election for the Croatian president. Serbs from Bosnia do not vote to elect a Serbian president. Croats from Bosnia vote to elect people in the Croatian parliament. Serbs in Bosnia do not vote for to elect people in the Serbian parliament. All Croats in Bosnia received Croatian passports. 2,400 Serbs from Bosnia and Herzegovina out of 1.5 million have received a Serbian passport. So uh, Serbia, neither Croatia, are trying to destabilize Bosnia. And in fact, the improvement in the relations between Serbia and Croatia is a very positive development for the stabilization of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, of late, after the elections of last year, Mr. Bakir Izetbegovic, having been elected as a, as a leader of the Bosniaks, he uh, also made several statements uh, for the need for compromise and for a way forward. And uh, my president, Boris Tadic, who, by the way, uh, cracked a little joke when he met the three uh, members of the collective presidents of Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Sarajevo, he said, hey, I'm the only one to be born in Sarajevo here, because he was born in Sarajevo, actually. And uh, this, is, this is the Balkans. I'm half Montenegrin. <laughs> Boris Tadic, his father is from, uh, Serb from, Monten uh, from Montenegro. His mother is, uh, is from Croatia. We are mixed still. And again, I, th I see the mixing happening, still happening. And so I can tell you that for Montenegro, for instance, there has been I would say, although that has been a very difficult thing, because you have, according to some estimates, up to 200,000 Montenegrins living in Serbia. I gave you just a few examples of people who are Montenegrin in Serbia, and Serbs in Montenegro, uh, at the latest census in Montenegro in September, 44.6% uh, of people said they were speaking Serbian, and about a third expressed themselves as being Serbs. We are closed. Nevertheless, Serbia was the first country to recognize and independent Montenegro after the referendum of 2006. And uh, uh, we look forward to Montenegro, hopefully, at the December summit uh, getting at the date. And not a date for a date, because that's yet another creative idea that has been toyed around currently. For those who would like not a single country from the Western Balkans to start negotiations soon, there are such countries in Europe, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, to have a real date with a, a day and a month <laughs> for next year to start negotiations because uh, after the reforms they have conducted, we believe that they deserve it. And now let me move to the fight against organized crime and corruption before I finish with the economy and knowledge economy. Um, one of the most important things that happened over the last two or three years was that uh, Serbia, together with the other countries uh, of the world, in particular United Kingdom and the United States, and then with help from the region, we broke the back of the most dangerous drug cartel of our region, the Sharij brothers. They're either behind bars or on the run. We captured 2.5 tons of cocaine um, in Uruguay, together with the DEA and SOCA. I heard today in the parliament here that uh, one of the uh, main concerns is heroin usage here in Ireland. Mind you, by fighting and being recognized by those international partners as a true partner in this fight, we know that we're helping a common European cause to making sure that the Balkans are not a transit route for drugs, for um, human um, uh, uh, trafficking and um, other uh, terrible things. So we need to work together in order to take the stain out of the good name of the Balkans. 
is the mafia uh, Balkanic tradition? I'm going to, su I'm going to surprise you. No. <laughs> Unlike maybe in other European countries, there has never been a social tradition of parallel institutions, social services done by the mob to the people, kind of trying to make up for the deficiencies of the state or trying to get allegiance uh, for long-standing influence in society. No, there is organized crime. It's a direct reflection of the conflicts of the 90s, the wars, the economic sanctions that led to trade being illegal, to the smuggling of oil and cigarettes where people made huge amounts of money. But those are the links that are being uh, currently severed. And I think that the last two or three years have been seeing a very big progress. And that progress was to a large degree allowed by agreements we have signed in March last year with Croatia and then with Montenegro in September, which are showing that the Balkans are not a safe house for criminals. That the old saying now that mafias in the Balkans collaborate way better than states is being turned upside down, as it should. That states collaborate much better in order to fight the common problem. Does it mean that we have already taken uh, care of organized crime and corruption? No. <laughs> but let me tell you, the situation is way better. There is no situation anymore. Let me illustrate how it looks to our people. But Mr. O'Donnell was living in Belgrade. People would go and say, you see this cafe? It belongs to, you know? Or you see this nightclub? You see this villa on the most luxurious part of Novi Sad? Well, the cafe today is United Colors of Benetton. <laughs> the nightclub is closed. <laughs> and the villa now is a social institution. 350 million euro worth of assets have been first frozen and then seized when people were condemned. We don't take offshoring as an answer. When there are suspected organized crime links, it is up to that lawyer who is positing as a nominee to prove that the money is legitimate with which it was bought. No Liechtenstein or other offshore will do. It's too easy. We are not going to be taken for an offshore ride. Of course, it's easier said than done, but I think we've made a lot of progress. And uh, if you ask our people, is there corruption, they will tell you yes. And I believe that in Serbia, there is still significant problems with that, but the situation is actually better than most people would have a feeling of. But then, then again, as, as, as I would say also, <laughs> Uh, in this part of Europe, we will say the proof of that pudding is in the eating. It's really in the proof of people being able to do business with us with anybody, without anybody asking for a fee or bribe or trying to have a, their favorite consultant, as those things go. Now on the economy. I'm really sorry that Ireland invested only 65 million euro to Serbia. Uh, we received 17 billion euro over the last 10 years. This year is going to be, despite the crisis, the ninth year in a row of us getting more than 1 billion US dollar of FDI. This is more than 5% of GDP every year. And after the first wave, which was for non-tradables, the telecom, the trade, the real estate, the insurance, and the banking, over the last three years we have moved into a more Irish territory, tradables, using Serbia as a production site for exports. And that's where our SAA is useful. That's where CEFTA, the regional trading uh, arrangement of the Balkans, that held up in terms of trade better than even our trade with the European Union over this crisis. The fact that uh, we have, uh, since the 90s, an agreement with Russia allowing Serbia to be the only non-CIS country to have a free trade zone with Russia, an opportunity that is being used, unfortunately not enough by Irish companies, but used by German, Italian, and other companies, an advantage that we'll be losing when joining the EU. But up until then, if at least 50% of the added value is produced in the region, not only Serbia, you can export customs free to Russia. A German pharmaceutical maker, Stada, for instance, is doing precisely that. And many other companies as well. So we have the same thing with Kazakhstan. And after the visit of my president to Ukraine last week, I hope we're going to have the same thing with that country as well. We have. After discussion we had with the head of Michelin in Belgrade, uh, actually in Davos, you mentioned Davos, that's what Davos use, is used okay. for. They told us that had we had a free trade zone with Turkey, they could expand the tire facility they have uh, in Serbia with the, within the border, close to the border with Bulgaria. That's what we did. We negotiated in one year a 
free trade zone with Turkey, and now Michelin is doubling its capacity for the fact to serve that very big market, which is expanding quite fast. There are opportunities in Serbia and the Balkans. Turkey, for instance, is finishing in 2013 a tunnel on the Bosphorus for freight trains. This is going to open because right now you need to, to put the train in two or three pieces on barges. Not easy. With this, of course, it's marketed as going from you know, uh, Berlin to Beijing, uh, maybe not as far, but at least to uh, Turkey, the Middle East, and Central Asia, that's definitely opening a new ecologically responsible and cheaper route for uh, uh, certain types of trade. And of course, for Serbia, it's very important to be on the transit line. That's why we're investing. And that's why we'd like to have the opportunity in the Connecting Europe facility proposed by the European Commission for the multi-financial perspective 2014-2020 to be used for such pan-European uh, projects, uh, as it were. You might not know it, but our Danube strategy was made by an Irish consulting firm. This is some of the surprising ways of, uh, of the European integration. But with 588 kilometers of this biggest uh, uh, with the Rhine uh, River of Europe, we have a big stake in the new macro-regional strategy of the European Union on the Danube. And finally, what we hope is with uh, an attractive fiscal system, and here we took more than one page from a, an Irish tax book, and also investing 400 million euro for uh, science and technology infrastructure right now, and looking at ways, and I, I was with uh, Mr. Cunningham was it, uh, in Kyoto, uh, He's been advising Irish governments for 30 years, more or less, on education and, and knowledge. I've been trying to download everything I could download from him for years now. Uh, and I know that probably it looks really hard from uh, Dublin today. I understand some students were in the streets yesterday. But, uh, but you know, we look and we see the problem that happens with this speculation. But believe it or not, <laughs> you are a model for us. <laughs> We look at the improvement at the education level, the capacity to create a workforce that has the skills to work with some of the most advanced com uh, companies in the world, the way Ireland used its diaspora and the links with other countries. And I can tell you if uh, there are two countries that we are looking as a model right now, it is Ireland and Slovakia. Ireland because of high tech and Slovakia because of the automotive industry. Mm. Congratulations to them without any tradition in that area they are now the country producing most cars per head in the world. And in two weeks, we will be opening the first car factory to be opened in Europe in five years, the Fiat factory in the city of Kragujevac That's for a new model uh, going up to next year to 250,000 um, cars per year. That's a 1 billion euro investment. So uh, I hope I was not neither too long nor too short. Uh, yes, there are still problems. Those problems are much more tractable than the ones we had 10 years ago. They are more tractable than the ones we had five years ago. Because of the crisis, I'm afraid, there are certain problems that have become bigger over the last few years. Serbia has a debt to GDP of 44% of GDP, and a budget deficit which is 4%, and a fiscal responsibility law taking us down to 1% in 2015. We're going to do that. This being said, we have a private debt. And you mentioned before we, we came to this room that uh, it's too easy and simplistic to separate public and, and, and private debt. If something goes wrong with the private debt, um, it goes wrong. But uh, although I have many questions about rating agencies, I have to report to you that Standard & Poor upgraded Serbia this year. We're the only country in Europe that was upgraded uh, from BB- to BB. And the OECD upgraded us from a very low category 7 to category 6. And we're the only country in the world to have been upgraded uh, by that organization. So there is potential. The region has the potential to be the fastest growing piece of Europe the way that Central Europe was in the past decade. This crisis has muddied a bit the map and the, and the, and the perspective, but still the, the basic elements uh, are there. So uh, thank you very much uh, for a kind invitation and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any, any questions. And I'll be uh, no less or no more open once we move into uh, uh, you know, your uh, house rules. Thank you very much indeed. Mm. Thank you.